Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, let's get started. So the topic today will be on um, promoting shared micromobility to complement um, public transit. So uh, b before we, we talk about uh, the, the talk itself, uh, let me introduce myself a little bit more. Um, anybody in this room uh, who like are super interested in transportation, innovative mobility options? Please, yes, please raise your hand. Wow, that, that, that's a lot of you. Awesome, awesome. How many of you like uh, ride e-scooters? Nobody? One, one person, I saw one. Uh, but how many of you ride bicycles? That's almost all of you, awesome. So um, it, it's all related. And I assume almost everybody takes transit. Anybody know? <laughs> Raise your hand. And <laughs> You shouldn't be here if you don't take transit, right? All right, so uh, over the years, since my graduate studies, uh, innovative mobility, like new mobility options, like ride hailing, uh, shared micromobility, including Uber, Lyft, uh, e-scooters, shared bikes, or all those uh, new mobility options are a key of my uh, research agenda. And the fundamental thing I want to study about them is their interaction with public transportation. Are they hurting transit or they, are they helping, in tra uh, helping, helping transit? And how can we make these modes work together to compete with uh, the joint in the room driving? Uh, the US has a uh, car, depend car dependency problem and um, almost needs to work together to, to uh, allow people not to uh, drive all the time. So that has been a, a key um, focus of, of my research and specifically I'm interested in um, how do we integrate these different uh, shared use modes to improve access to destinations. That's the key for, uh, the, that's the fundamental goal of transportation, getting people to places they want to go. And then um, through reducing car dependency and reducing transportation costs, improving uh, social equity and improved uh, environmental sustainability. So this slide kind of summarizes um, my, my research interest and the research approach I take because uh, when I study these topics, I mainly try to leverage all sorts of data. It could be super big data sets that goes to three terabytes or even larger, uh, or, or small data sets that's only 10 uh, uh, megabytes, so like, like survey data. And uh, I mainly engage with quantitative uh, analysis like spatial analytics or develop statistical models sometimes uh, with specific tasks, leveraging AI machine learning algorithms. And uh, the, the fundamental goal is to understand travel behavior to inform policy and operation decisions. Uh, I work with uh, both private entities and public agencies to, to help inform their decisions and sometimes develop uh, analytical tools to, to help uh, them make uh, better decisions. So that's, uh, about my, my research uh, agenda and, and my um, re uh, research interest. Today's talk is about uh, shared micromobility and uh, transit. This photo on the left was taken uh, in Gainesville, uh, actually by my wife. And uh, that, that shows a lot of people using these micromobility modes, like scooters, bicycles. We, we thought it's very nice. Um, the, the presentation today will have uh, four components. First of all, a uh, very brief background w on why I'm studying this. And uh, then the meat of, of the talk will focusing on two major branches of studies. One is uh, trying to understand transit and sh shared micromobility interactions using a big data set called uh, GBFS. We will get there in, in a second. And then uh, the second component is on exploring and evaluating strategies to promote transit and shared micromobility integration with mainly survey data. And uh, in the end, I will um, ha have a short discussion on how, how, on how I think about the pros and cons of big and small data sets. I'm a data nerd, so I like to think about these questions. Um, so background, not sure how many of you seen this graph uh, before on the left. This graph shows you the growth of shared micromobility uh, ridership in North America since 2010. And um, the darker green is on station-based bike share, which everybody was more familiar with. 
um, the top is scooter share, the dockless scooters. So you saw that in just two years, the scooter share ridership has already doubled that of station-based bike share. A lot of people spend a lot of efforts trying to promote bike share use, but unfortunately, the dockless e-scooter already has surpassed the <laughs> bike share um, uh, ridership. So, so that triggers an interest in me. Like, uh, since we they are growing so fast, can we figure out best ways to inter integrate them into the urban transportation system? Usually, the micro mobility modes they can um, serve very short trips. And transit, we know that when you want to get to places, it's often very difficult to get to the bus stop, transit stop, or uh, go from the transit stop to your final destination. That single uh, last mile, the, the so-called last mile problem, often prevents people from using transit. So I was thinking, like, can we figure out better ways to um, connect people to transit stops and can shared e-scooters bikes help? So that was a major uh, motivation uh, for, for all, all of the work I, I, I did. And I did, at the time I started the project, I looked into some existing work to, to see uh, the empirical evidence on whether that idea could potentially work. So um, I, I found some sources that indicating, uh, ba based on survey work mainly, between 5% to 61% of the e-scooter or uh, dockless bike users have used uh, th those modes to connect with transit. So that means um, a lot of people are already doing that, and, uh, but, but there is a large variation across uh, cities that have been studied. And then the second stat that uh, in w was interesting was um, even though these micromobility modes, they could complement transit, sometimes they replace short transit trips. So uh, the finding was between 2% to 34% of the e-scooter trips were replacing uh, transit trips. So b based on my uh, search of the literature, I, I found large variations across cities in terms of the potential for e-scooters to uh, complement transit. And uh, one interesting thing was the public agencies, they were very curious, and including uh, the e-scooter operators, they were curious about the percentage of e-scooter trips made to connect with transit, meaning like they serve as a first mile, last mile feeder. But this number has been very hard to obtain from uh, the existing uh, data collecting methods. Um, and, and because of the large variation across cities, I thought uh, detailed case studies of certain cities will be very interesting. So when I thought about these research ideas, I was working with um, some empirical data sets and we, we got some nice data from Washington, D.C. D.C. started its dockless micromobility program in 2017. And a very good thing that the city implemented was to requiring these companies to share their data through a public available application program interface, API. And everybody can get access to the data and uh, do, do a lot of interesting work with that. So uh, in 2019, uh, or end of 2018, I started to uh, put together uh, the, the data. Uh, w when I started to work, work, with, work with the data, it had a deep learning curve. Like uh, the data was uh, messy, the data was uh, not easy to collect. Like usually when you work with data sets, you go to a website, you download the spreadsheet, you start to work with it. But this data is called ge the general bike share feed specification data. It's available through um, APIs, and the data is real-time data feeds. So basically, at this moment, you got the data uh, for the city, uh, and then the next moment, you access the API again. That, uh, it has been indicating a, a, the, a, the data for a different time point. So we need to uh, develop an algorithm to constantly access the data and then store the data because of its nature. Like uh, on the bullet point listed here, you see like uh, we need to access the data through API and URL. And then uh, the API updates itself every one minute or every five minutes. And the data mainly records the location of the available uh, vehicles. So that's all, all what the data uh, is about. And that's the, how, how the raw data look like. And uh, it took me some efforts uh, w with help of some excellent um, 
uh, research assistants to, to process the data and connect the data with some other useful uh, data sets like the social demographics and, um, and also the uh, local transportation uh, regulation like the par no parking zones, etc. This slide is complicated. It's just trying to tell you that there's a lot of technical work behind this. And after processing all, all of the data, we, we extract two key pieces of information that we think could be useful for addressing my research interest that I mentioned earlier. One is we can know the e-scooter supply at any moment because uh, the data was real time and it's updating constantly, right? So this map shows you the available e-scooters at 7 a.m. on July 20th, 29, 2019. So we, we know the supply side. And then we can also understand the demand side by checking a specific device or vehicle. So you see this red dot uh, moving. That was one e-scooter changing its location throughout the day. And then based on that uh, trajectory, you can then infer the trips, the origins and destinations, and also how long the e-scooter has been sitting at a location, like so the so-called idle time. So with both understanding of the supply and demand, um, I, I start to think about how do we conceptualize the problem that I'm interested in. Like do you, that, that's why doing a PhD is hard, right? Like you have a good motivation for a um, topic, but then the, your professors ask you like, what, how, how do you conceptualize the problem? How to ask good research questions? So I started with this, asking myself uh, these questions that uh, I can address with, with the data sets. So the motivating question was, do e-scooters compete or complement public transit? And specifically, uh, I want to look into these three aspects. First one is, the compete versus complement question, really you need to look at both the supply side and also the demand side. The supply side meaning like, are e-scooters supplied at the same location that transit services are also provided, right? So that was all the first research question about. And on the second question, I was trying to figure out when we observe some e-scooter trips, are they replacing or complementing transit trips? So that was looking at the problem from the uh, demand side. Uh, and the third one is, like when you see a, a, an e-scooter trip potentially replacing a transit trip, you also need to look at people's alternatives. Let's say the e-scooter trip takes five minutes and the transit trip takes 30 minutes, then you're like, yeah, it's replacing transit, but we are okay with it, uh, if it's that much time difference. But if you are seeing like e-scooter is 10 minutes, transit is 12 minutes, you're like, uh, dude, hopefully that person would take transit next time, right? So, so that, that was the thinking behind um, the third question. Um, and with the research questions, then we, we um, develop this analytical framework. We, we need to do three aspects of analysis. The supply side, uh, the demand side, and look at uh, travel time comparisons between uh, e-scooter trips versus their fastest transit alternatives. And, and to do the analysis, we need to ha have good data. And um, the GBFS data uh, was processed, as I mentioned earlier. Another data set we used was the general transit speed specification data. Uh, that data set, I assume some of you might have heard of it. Even if you haven't heard of it, you are using it every day when you are using Google Maps. That was, uh, this is the key data set powering the, the apps uh, for, for transit schedule. So uh, we, we integrate all this data set together to, to do uh, the three aspects of the analysis. And um, these are two maps showing the supply uh, of transit and supply of uh, e-scooter services. Um, the, sorry, the technique used here is kernel density, very simple uh, GIS technique. The idea is uh, kernel density basically measures the intensity of a resource and uh, the, the intensity will decrease uh, by distance. And uh, transit usually we assume the service area is a quarter mile, so the bus stop has the highest transit service intensity, and then starting from that bus stop, you, you see the intensity decrease until it reaches zero at the one quarter mile uh, uh, radius. 
And for e-scooters, we assume the service radio to be one eighth of a mile or one sixteenth. Um, I, I need to double check that with that. But um, we, we choose a small service uh, radius for e-scooters. So, so you see that the supply. And reading from these two maps, it's hard to tell like um, the degree of their competition. Like you can clearly see well, transit has been supplied, e-scooters has also been supplied, but it's the intensity of the two services. Are they really competing each other uh, head to head? Uh, so so we, we just run a simple correlation analysis. Like if the intensity has very high correlation, uh, then, then that means higher competition. And it looks like the, the result uh, was, the, the coefficient was between 0.5 to 0.6 so it's not terrible, but it's also not great. Uh, if it's zero, close to zero, that means they perfectly com complement each other. If it's close to one, then they are, are competing with each, with each other uh, fiercely. And uh, we, we have a value range because we measure this uh, over time. Like in the morning when the uh, e-scooter companies put their scooters somewhere, uh, users would use the e-scooters and their locations shift over time. And so uh, you, you have different values throughout the day. And um, 0.45 to point oh, uh, 0.61, that, that was uh, the final number. And uh, on the demand side, what we did was trying to um, come up with this conceptual diagram to, to classify um, e-scooter trips. So a trip has an origin and a destination. So we, we, let's, uh, th this line here shows a transit route, and then this is another transit route. And this gray area is one quarter mile buffer from the uh, transit stop. So if we observe an e-scooter's origin and its destination both falling within the service area of a transit stop, that means like that trip could potentially be made by transit, right? And um, we further uh, divide uh, this into two types. One is that trip can be connected by a direct route versus uh, that e-scooter trip can be, serve, uh, can be taken by transit, but uh, you need to take at least one transfer to complete the trip. So um, with this idea, uh, we, we have four trip types for the e-scooter trip. The first type, second type, I already explained. The third type is we have one end of the trip uh, falling within the transit service area. The other end is outside. And the fourth type is both trip ends are outside of the transit service area. So um, basically this classification, you, you will expect, you, you, you could think uh, then as uh, the more, if more trips are trip type one or trip type two, there will be greater competition between the two modes. If you see more trips on the other end, then that's greater complementarity. Take a guess. In DC, what's the distribution for, for the four types? Anyone want to try? Th this makes simple, like type two plus type two, uh, the type one plus type two versus type three plus type four. What's the rough split? Go ahead. Type three will be the most common. And then type two, type one, type four. Okay. Any other guesses? Go ahead. That's another guess. Almost like like almost. Uh, give me more exact estimate. That's very close. That's that's very good. Here are the numbers. So <laughs> you see over three quarters as type one, and then um, about 20% type two. Type three and type four, <laughs> very small percentage. In total, they are like less than 5%. So um, I, when I first saw this, I was like, oh shoot. Um, <laughs> the the e-scooters are spring up the transit network. Um, but uh, one thing to take into consideration is um, when, when you survey, you, you, when, when you look at the uh, survey studies on e-scooter riders, you ask them, do you take transit? 
about half of them said, I never take transit. So uh, that, that's, that's the key here. This conceptual diagram, when, when I first uh, developed it, I thought it's very nice. It helped us classify e scooter trips. But then uh, I realized um, a, a key uh, thing that's been missing from here is uh, it tends to uh, bias the results in indicating greater competition. Because uh, even though you observe some e scooter trips potentially uh, could be made by transit, we need to figure out if the user are really thinking about transit in the first place and, and uh, what barriers prevent, from, uh, prevent them from using transit. Uh, that, that's another question. So, so this, um, uh, diagram, uh, th this uh, classification is helpful, but uh, the results are somewhat suggestive. And another thing is, uh, I, I think when uh, we, we heard uh, you, you say in the uh, estimate, you, you were looking at the map. DC is a special area with one of the most extensive uh, transit network in, in the country. Like when you look at this map, there are very few places that you can uh, see, see uh, uh, co complementing trips happening. So, so that's uh, another context thing to, to uh, consider for, for the results here. So uh, we, we, we then move on to conduct further analysis. This uh, is one of the, this slide shows you the estimates for uh, real connecting trips happening in DC. And it will have the opposite problem compared to uh, the, the previous slide. So uh, we, what, what, what we did was um, we, we took the metro entrances and then we think if someone has taken an e-scooter to connect with uh, the metro system or have taken an uh, e-scooter to their final destination, then the uh, origin and destination will be very close to the entrance, right? So we, we basically group um, all the trips happening between 30 feet, that was the estimate at the lower bound, and uh, all use an, a higher bound, 100 feet, from a metro entrance and uh, classify all trips happening in that uh, threshold as real connecting trips. And you can easily think about the problem. Anybody want to give it a try? Well, what's the issue with this approach? Like you, you, you observe trip origins, destinations. When you see the origin or destination close to a metro entrance and you think that trip was made to connect with the metro system. It's kind of um, a bold assumption, right? It could be like, I happen to park my uh, scooter here, or, or uh, the, the trip, uh, the, there happened to be a destination uh, near the entrance that I go to. So, so that's, that's the key issue, and that means like we tend to overestimate. There could be some underestimate, like some people park somewhat far from the metro entrances, but uh, we, we think the overestimation could, could be a, a, a more serious problem here. But um, regardless, this approach is commonly uh, used in the literature, and uh, we, we th this is kind of the only data source we, we can work with when we see trip data. So uh, we, we did an estimate uh, on the percentage. And the fact that, that we have tested the, two, the, the upper bound and lower bound and see the results didn't shift too much, that means like even though we have concerns about the accuracy of the result, we, we are kind of, uh, the, the concern was somewhat mitigated by having um, the result reasonably close to each other. So uh, another thing interesting about uh, the, the results shown here is we did the analysis both before COVID and, uh, and, uh, and during COVID, June 2019 versus June 2020. So before COVID, you see like the trips has uh, obvious peaks during the commuting hours. But during COVID, like a lot of people were working from home. So, so you didn't see this uh, using e-scooter to connect with the metro system um, during COVID, and so uh, these are our fi final estimated numbers. About ten, uh, el about eleven percent of the e-scooter trips were real connecting before COVID, and only about six percent um, during COVID. And the last analysis we did was to uh, compare the travel time for an e-scooter trip versus its fastest. 
transit alternative. So we basically what we did was we know the origin of this trip, we know the destination, and then we use the, uh, like imagine you are doing a Google map search from that OD pair, what will be the uh, transit time for that trip? And so um, what we observed was um, compared to the trans fastest transit alternative, on average, the e-scooter riders were saving about five minutes. Um, and, and here are other characteristics about the e-scooter trips. Like uh, in DC, because it's pretty compact, the trips were pretty short. It's about three quarters mile. And then uh, the duration was only about 10 minutes. And uh, the median cost was uh, almost $4. Um, we also look at the numbers during COVID. And uh, you, you saw the price has gone up quite a bit during COVID. And uh, the, the trips has been longer. That the, the fact that the e-scooter trips have been longer already indicate they are replacing some other modes like transit. Uh, during COVID, people are not taking transit uh, as much. And uh, the travel time savings was much less. So um, you, can you can interpret the results in different ways. But uh, to, to, me, to, to us, I, I think uh, our main takeaway was uh, e-scooters had some competition with transit. Uh, but when you think about the COVID context, they kind of serve a, a, an important part of the urban transportation by enhancing the resilience of the uh, public mobility system. Like when people are concerned about taking transit, uh, they, they had the e-scooter option available. So that, so, so that was uh, somewhat helpful. Um, so to, to summarize the main findings, what we found from this research um, was we found that the service area of e-scooters e -scooter, e and transit largely overlap, and uh, most e-scooter trips could have been made by transit. And we estimated about 10% of the e-scooter trips to be connecting with the rail system in, in Washington, D.C. These results are only for D.C. Um, other areas definitely could have d different findings. Um, so, so we think uh, there are two main policy implications here. One is, um, Currently, when you look at the transit agencies in the U.S., there has been very little efforts trying to promote uh, the integration with shared micromobility. If they actively, actively do that, then they might incentivize the operators to place more e-scooters at locations underserved by transit. Like uh, currently, usually they charge a permit fee for the operators to put the e-scooters on the street. But if, let's say, they, they waive the permit fee if they uh, have the uh, companies put the e-scooters in, in uh, underserved areas. And uh, also, we, we think uh, there, there could be a lot of ways to uh, develop the integration between the two modes, but uh, strategies ha haven't been uh, explored enough or been implemented enough. And um, the paper has more discussion on this, but um, I will talk about this aspect, the strategies, a little bit more in the second part of the uh, talk. So b before I get there, uh, let me pause for a second and uh, explain why um, I uh, you, you uh, like start with this big data set. Like this, uh, we spend a lot of time processing data and get excited about it. Got some interesting results, but then realize not enough. Need to uh, do a different study. Uh, and here, uh, this slide show, shows you the the main reason. Like uh, we. When we think more about the issue, we really uh, are curious about who are the e-scooter users, who, who are, are making the trips that we observe for different contexts. And second, why and how their decisions were made. What, what prevents them from uh, using transit or what could encourage them to use shared micromobility more to connect with transit? All these big data sets, like we, we, we have done what we can uh, during the classification you have seen look at the uh, supply side and do travel time analysis. But um, we have to do a survey to look deep into these uh, questions, these two aspects listed here. Um, so, so that motivates the second study. But before um, I, I get here, any questions, any major comments for, for the first component? All clear? All good? Okay. Hopefully you are still with me. We are at 30 minutes. I know like 
it, it's hard to get people's attention uh, nowadays, right? So I, I do my best. Um, so we, we, we did a travel survey in DC, and then because of the context issue I mentioned uh, earlier, we were thinking we, we should also look at Los Angeles. So we did the survey, uh, uh, the, uh, a similar survey in Los Angeles as well. And uh, do, doing the survey, we got some funding support from the uh, University Transportation Center and, we, uh, and also Ford. We, we, had, uh, we were fortunate to have the industry partners to help uh, with, this, with this effort. And in the end, uh, we collected over 600 responses from each uh, study area. And um, mainly the data collected uh, focused on four aspects. One is uh, we try to understand the respondents' travel, be travel behavior and their preferences. Uh, we asked them some questions about to what degree last mile problem of transit prevent them from using, tra using transit. We then ask some questions about their uh, preference for e-scooters and their, uh, the, the potential for them to use e-scooters to, to connect with transit to solve the last mile problem. And then like almost all surveys, you want to ask some social demographic uh, information for, for the respondent. So th th those are the main data uh, collected from the survey. And we leverage the data to do two ana uh, analyses and, and modeling. One is looking at uh, the human behavior aspect. We were trying to figure out, like, um, are the respondents even considered to use shared micromobility, like e-scooters, to connect with transit in the first place? And then uh, we also try to measure their actual frequency of doing that. And so we, we have two separate models to, to model those two aspects. And secondly, um, because we had Spin as a, a partner on the project, they were super curious. Like, if they are able to do bundled pricing with, these, uh, with, with transit authorities, bundled pricing basically means like, if someone takes an e-scooter trip plus a transit trip, uh, the rider gets a discount somewhere, either on the transit fare side or on the e-scooter fare side. Uh, so they want to see like the impact of, of that. Um, so, so we did some modeling on this aspect as well. So let me um, get to this one by one. First, um, on, on studying the intention and actual behavior, here are the research questions we, we try to address. How often do people consider e-scooters as a last mile uh, solution? And what factors shape this intention, sh shape their uh, uh, willingness to use e-scooters. And second, uh, for the, the current e-scooter users, how frequently do they use e-scooters to connect with transit and what factors uh, shape the frequency? So you can see like these two questions, one is focusing, focusing on everybody, uh, users plus non-users. The second question focuses on the existing users. And uh, before doing an, any analysis, when you do a survey, it's good practice to look into the data and see if there are some biases. So we compare the, uh, the sample with the city uh, population. Uh, we found we probably had a higher percentage of the e-scooter users and transit users in our survey because they are like close to 50%. They are like 45 to 43% of the sample. Like we will be super excited if we see uh, in the U.S. 43% of the, the travelers are using transit. Um, reality is no. So, so we know we, we oversample the transit users. We also oversample males, white population, younger people, and people with uh, middle income. And so uh, the, the, the bias requires us to apply some sample weights in um, the analysis, this descriptive analysis. Um, Sample weights is less of a concern for modeling, uh, so, so we didn't apply that, uh, but it's a minor technical detail. So let me, let me show you some um, important findings from, from the uh, survey. First of all, uh, we asked this question in, in the survey, like, is the last mile problem a main reason for not using transit? Uh, before this question, we had some other questions related to uh, last mile or, or transit use. And uh, even in Washington, D.C., you see, like, only about 20% people said, no, last mile problem not, was not an issue. So you were like, 
you hope people are willing to walk ha uh, a quarter mile to transit stops, but a lot of people feel like that quarter mile is still a huge barrier. So um, th th when I first saw this, I was a little bit surprised. But when, when I uh, observe uh, people's behavior, especially when they are driving and see where they park, right? Some people are willing to uh, pay $10 for not walking for 25 uh, feet. So it's, it's kind of crazy, but uh, some, some cities, you, you, you can see that happening. Um, the follow-up question was, when for, for those who indicate last mile was a problem, we asked them, have you considered using e-scooters to solve that problem? And um, somewhat surprisingly, most people said yes. They, they would, like y in here and in small college towns, when you don't see a lot of those micro-mobility options, you probably don't, th this uh, e-scooters or dockless bikes don't even come to your mind too much. But I guess <coughs> in big cities like DC and LA, when these options are on the street, they, they kind of would think about them. But we ask this follow-up question. Okay, you thought about uh, using them as a first mile, last mile solution, but did you end up using them when you considered it? And um, we, we saw like uh, a lot of people said never, they, they didn't end up using them. And uh, mo uh, most, the, the highest, the, the, uh, the category with the, the most responses are sometimes. They considered it, but they actually end up uh, not using it for uh, many cases. So that indicates there are a lot of barrier between uh, the willingness to share to use shared e-scooters to take transit uh, versus their actual behavior. Um, and and th this is another reason why we uh, study intention and act actual behavior uh, have different models. And finally, uh, we, we ask the existing e-scooter users to estimate the proportion of their trips made to connect with transit. And uh, a lot of them said, no, I just ride my e-scooters, I never use transit. Um, but uh, many of them said like about uh, less than 25% of their trips were made to connect with transit. And s for a small percentage of, of them, like they uh, a, a very large percentage, large percentage of their trips were made to connect with transit. So that's um, descriptive analysis. We, we then move on to uh, city models. Um, the first model was uh, looking at the question here, like have you considered using e-scooters to solve the last mile problem? So we, we, we have four categories. These uh, four categories could serve as a, a ordinal variable to fit a regression model to, to to figure out which population groups are more willing to use e-scooters uh, or consider using e-scooters to solve the last mile problem. And then we have a second model to look at uh, the actual frequency, like uh, that, that was corresponding to the last uh, question that I showed you a moment ago. So we have those two questions uh, serving as dependent variables, and then we were looking at what factors shape uh, the outcome. Uh, we looked into many variables, but um, when you look at the statistical results, um, these three columns summarize the, the results for the first model. Uh, unsurprisingly, you see people who use e-scooters or transit more frequently are more willing to consider the integration, and, and people who perceive e-scooters as safe to be uh, using the uh, option more. And uh, older people and women uh, are less willing to consider e-scooters as a uh, last mile uh, uh, solution. Somewhat um, surprisingly, some, some variables here were, were not significant. We, we know from the literature that uh, the current e-scooter users tend to be people with a li uh, mod like uh, the median to higher income and uh, people who are younger and white population, people with college degrees. But uh, some of these variables were, were not significant here. And uh, we, we also look at the second model, like the proportion of e-scooter trips made to connect with transit. And uh, he, here are the results. What, what's interesting here is on, on these two columns. So remember, older adults and women were less willing or have, like, they, they don't consider 
using e-scooters as a last mile option as their counterparts. But once they become users, they are using e-scooters to connect transit as much as uh, the other counterparts. So it's kind of like uh, the, the main, main barrier is for people to sign up for using the service. Um, and and uh, we also find that uh, white and people with college degree use e-scooters to connect with transit uh, less. So uh, if you interpret from the other direction, that means people of color and people without college degrees are using um, e-scooters to connect with transit more. And those populations tend to be uh, people who use transit more. So that, that was uh, kind of uh, exciting to, to see. Um, so quickly summarize the results, we um, see these three major things. E-scooters uh, may enhance uh, transport equity for people of color and uh, low-income travelers through connecting with transit. And um, they, they, uh, we, we, we should focus on promoting behavioral intention of women and old adults in using shared e-scooters to connect with transit, overcoming their behavioral intention is, is the key. And then finally, uh, the safety issue of micromobility is uh, super important uh, as the results has shown. Okay, uh, so last um, part of the modeling and, and the analysis, let me quickly uh, go through it. So we had this question asking people, what changes would make you use e-scooter to connect with transit more? And uh, what we learned was bundled pricing was uh, the, the most selected option. Uh, integrate pair, uh, payment options goes second, uh, meaning like you have a single app or, or single platform to, to pay for to the two modes. And then make uh, e-scooters available at transit stops better bicycle infrastructure, more parking space for e-scooters at uh, transit stops. So, so those were the uh, options. And as I mentioned earlier, we were interested in evaluating like the effectiveness of bundled pricing. So uh, that required us to do some uh, advanced uh, modeling work here. Uh, so, so we did think about the problem like, when you have a, a policy option or strategy you want to test out, but you haven't implemented it yet, how do you know what's the effect, right? You don't know. Um, so in transportation world, in travel behavior, what we often do is use this so-called stated choice experiment. We try to describe what will happen to the respondents and ask them to respond. Like uh, in this case, we were asking uh, respondents that, okay, tell me a recent trip or a trip that you regularly made and tell me like what's the travel time and cost uh, for that trip. So imagine somebody said, I drove to work. Okay, for that trip, let's uh, construct the, uh, auto like y if e-scooter or e-scooter plus transit will be the alternative options. Uh, now let's tweak some um, values for the e-scooter plus transit option because now we have bundled pricing. The price for that option becomes lower, right? So that, that was the, the idea. Like uh, you, don't, you haven't implemented things, but you ask people like for their own trip experience. When you imagine if this thing, this strategy has implemented, how would they respond? So uh, this is the technique. Um, doing that, and, and there are a lot of more details here I, I won't go through. Uh, it it's, uh, involves inv experimental design and uh, involves uh, having people uh, answering uh, multiple uh, choice experiments. And then based on the data we collected, we, we fit uh, discrete choice models. Um, it, it's uh, a, a, a type of technique in transportation that we often use to analyze and model how people make trade-offs between time and cost when they make travel decisions. So uh, fitting the model tells us a lot. Uh, we, we, we saw that uh, the, the from the model outputs that uh, non-white and low-income population have a stronger tendency to choose the e-scooter plus metro option compared to other population groups. But we also observe a lot of uh, so-called preference heterogeneity that means like different populations, uh, different population groups have 
very different preferences when they make their travel decisions. Things that matter to you don't matter to others. Uh, in, uh, to, to quickly summarize that. So uh, w with the model, uh, what we did was, okay, now uh, let's assume e-scooter companies started to implement the um, bundled pricing options with, with uh, transit agencies and see what happens. So the first row show sh shown here is the baseline. That's the current market share for different travel modes in uh, a, a study area. Let's assume this is Washington, D.C. Um, and this is not the actual uh, split for their whole travel. This is the uh, split for the trips reported by this uh, respondents. So a lot of respondents didn't report, uh, didn't report driving trips. That's why you see driving to be having a sh low market share here. And so um, we, we, uh, we, we could estimate like uh, once you implement the bundled fare, apply discounts to e-scooter fare, how much market share gains we can see from the e-scooter plus transit option. And here are, th are the results. Like when you see the results, it's kind of disappointing. It's not, not much. Um, that's what we thought about in the beginning, but then we, we started to uh, look at the uh, market, uh, the, the, uh, the percentage of trips taken by bicycles and also look at the volume of the trips. Like even though the, like those percentages were also uh, small, but when you count the, the volumes of uh, driving trips to be potentially replaced, then these numbers are not too small. And the other thing is, um, we, we were studying DC and uh, even for Los Angeles, it's somewhat dense compared to other parts of uh, US. So the market share gains could be larger if we are studying a less uh, dense area where the first mile, last mile trip length will be longer. So uh, basically we found um, integrating e-scooters and transit can promote equity and uh, cities with the less, less dense transit network have more to gain from bundled pricing. Uh, but uh, bundled pricing, y if you couple them with other strategies, they will have uh, better outcomes. So that's, that's all for the survey analysis. One last thing I want to uh, comment on was, the w when I think about giving the talk, um, I, I was trying to pick from my projects and how, how to like for, uh, to, to, to um, talk about something larger and since I'm a data nerd, I picked <laughs> data to talk about. And uh, you, you see in my um, presentation, I used two sets of data sets, like the uh, GBFS data from APIs and then the survey data. And um, when, when you do your own work, um, you often need to face this uh, consideration, like what data set do I use? Are there major limitations in my data set that I need to deal with? So. Um, my 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 own work has dealt with like uh, has dealt with big data in a lot of cases because um, that's the hot area that's the area less explored. But over the years, once I work with more on big data sets, I often feel like a part of the research <laughs> is missing, and that's a very important part of the work. So often, when I finish a big data project, I often come back to use traditional methods like uh, surveys or even sometimes uh, do some informal interviews to really understand um, what's happening with, with the, what's happening behind the big data. Because often when we work with big data sets, we, we can extract very rich geospatial patterns or temporal patterns. Uh, you, you can do a lot of fancy analysis, visualization with that. Uh, and, and often the data collection is cheap because uh, a computer solves a lot of the issues we need to deal with. But um, when we try to understand the why and how questions, the big data sets are often very weak on that regard. And also we often have no social demographic information associated with, uh, so the people behind the data, uh, it, it's uh, what, what the planning profession ha has uh, shown to be uh, something very important and the big data often um, doesn't get into that. So, so I often want to um, thoughtfully uh, and hopefully creatively integrate the two types of data um, in my own work to, to get to the bottom of the research topics I am interested in. And um, that's 
if you are interested in transportation, you, you hopefully enjoy the, the transportation content. If you don't, then this is the key message I hope you can take away from the talk. Um, that's all for my talk. And uh, one last thing I want to show you is acknowledge my uh, co-authors and student uh, research assistant, Eric Huang, uh, Ang Joel Brodu, Josh Johnson, and Shile Zhao. Um, that, that's all for today. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> Questions, comments? Go ahead, please. Is it related from LA or from Washington? It's from both. I, um, we, we didn't find many huge differences between the two cities, so I haven't highlighted them, but there are some uh, differences that we, we have discussed in the uh, paper. I think um, one difference is uh, in LA, you, you see the uh, e-scooter trips tend to be longer, and so the market gains from um, the, the uh, bundle pricing to be a bit larger. Good question. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, like, um, first of all, are even big data available, right? right. Um, sometimes I think um, we, we, we planners uh, could easily dismiss, okay, in, in, let's say, in housing and community development, big data are not important at all. Like, we, we are not thinking about those issues. But um, think about technology in general, like uh, how technology has shaped community development, de economic development. Like one example in, in housing and community development is, like I remember I read papers that try to leverage Craigslist uh, data to figure out uh, some, some uh, engagement with, with uh, technology uh, across neighborhoods and um, some other types of digital platforms that has some association with community life, community development. And those are like data sets that we barely being used in planning or even in any research area at all. So um, the, the question is though, like when we think about uh, all sorts of technology or big data, I, I think more fundamentally we need to think about um, why are we looking at this? It's like sometimes for, for, um, for myself and for, for the uh, my, uh, graduate students, like you want to engage with big data because that, that's hot topic that help you train good skills that get you uh, into some technical jobs. But um, e eventually like the trend will cool down. And then y if you want to move up uh, in your career, I think uh, what matters more is how do you critically connect the dots? So asking some interesting questions and then think about uh, what, what big data sorts, uh, big data sets can be uh, used to address those questions uh, will be more interesting. Like I have seen way too many so-called big data papers telling us things we have known three decades ago. And you're like, that's it? It's not useful at all, right? Great question. I haven't done some, uh, something directly related to that, but kind of <coughs> related. Um, so so uh, when I was doing the, the work, uh, I, I had a lot of conversation with the micro mobility manager in Washington, DC. And then uh, 
my research uh, helped her in some decisions, but one thing that she mentioned a lot is like the sidewalk riding issue for, for e-scooters. And so when she saw that um, the micromobility safety, how, how that being perceived by riders, she, she took that evidence to, to argue in her agency that they need to figure out better ways on, on their sidewalks and stuff. Um, I'm not sure if they are implementing that at all. Uh, <coughs> so, so that's one thing. The other thing is um, my, my recent work is on uh, mobility hubs, the so-called uh, multimodal hubs where different travel modes can come together, right? And, and this, the, the project is funded by Florida Department of Transportation. They are interested in improving infrastructure and uh, mobility hubs are like the nodes in a transportation network try to connect in the different travel modes. But an easy extension is like the streetscape and the, uh, the, the uh, pedestrian and bicyclist amenities facilities surrounding those nodes. Like you can have a perfect hub that you put tons of uh, uh, bicycle park in there. But if the streetscape and the sidewalk bike lanes surrounding that hub is shitty, then nobody would use that hub, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. You, uh, you, you first. That's a great comment. Uh, the reality is, the I personally, I think the only way to make it happen is to have the public agencies take a big, bigger role to incentivize by either pr provide financial incentives or like uh, developing better infrastructure to promote the demand. Because e-scooter companies or like the uh, e-bike, the, the dockless bike companies they are for-profit entities, right? So they only do business at places that they can make money. And uh, in places without robust transit network, usually they are also lower density areas that they can't make a profit. Like uh, in starting from late 2020, just last year, I, I saw uh, scooter companies started to uh, suffer from financial losses and then they, they, they kind of scale down their operations across uh, the United States. And that's because like the venture capital funds has started to run out. And so, so I think the, the bigger question uh, there is how can we make transportation agencies and planning authorities in the US to value this shared micromobility options or micromobility like bicycling more so the demand naturally comes. Like w when you see like big cities or even smaller cities in Asia, in Europe, like they they don't receive public, so, uh, they don't receive any public funds for their operations, but they have a healthy market for, for those options to prosper. In the US, it's just hard because of the lack of infrastructure and uh, unsafe uh, environment we live in. Great comment. A, qu a quarter mile. Yeah, th that, that, that was kind of the rule of thumb we, we used in the transportation world. Uh, basically assume people are willing to walk uh, five minutes to the uh, transit stop. It's definitely something argu arguably could be changed, but it's just the most commonly used threshold. And um, f that, that's usually for bus stops. For rail stations, for metro stations, uh, the assumption often goes to half a mile, like, like you mentioned.
and it's good you can come out of the box. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much.